Hello, I'm Adrian Warmenhoven and you're listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today we have episode 296 for October 31st, 2022. So, yeah, first of all, happy Halloween to everybody out there. Hope you had a fun and spooky evening for those of you who celebrate. There's one news item that I'm going to talk about right now. We'll maybe talk about but this more next week. But Elon Musk finally did manage to buy Twitter. That is a done deal. He is already, you know, heads are rolling already at Twitter. And who knows where this is going to go. I actually know several people who have lost their accounts, permanently banned uh, on Twitter recently, just before this takeover. I don't know why. They weren't given a specific reason, uh, but they basically said you have to appeal it. And who knows how long that would take. Since they didn't really do anything that seemed to provoke this, I'd I have to at least say that, you know, maybe I might lose my account too. And if that's the case, I will probably just give up and go to Mastodon. I'm not even sure I'm going to bother to appeal that. It would really suck because I, <laughs> I just managed to crack a thousand followers on, on Twitter and I would hate to lose all that now. But if that's what happens, you know, what are you going to do? So Anyway, if, uh, if that happens, if you're a follower on Twitter uh, or want to be a follower on Twitter, and for some reason I just disappear and my account goes away, look for me on Mastodon. And you might say, what is Mastodon? Well, Mastodon is a federated Twitter, basically. It's, there's no one central boss. There's no one central server. They're all federated, so they kind of cross post to each other. And so there really isn't a single place to lose your account, to be banned, to be deplatformed from Mastodon. So and it's a lot cleaner. I mean, Mastodon doesn't have a lot of the crap that Twitter feeds you. So it, it's really kind of nice. I'm trying to actually use it more uh, than I have been. And certainly if I get booted off Twitter, I will be using it exclusively for that kind of content. Anyway, long story short, if for some reason you're a follower on Twitter or want to be a follower on Twitter and I suddenly go away, look for me on Mastodon. Also, if you go to my website, firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, uh, there's a contact page there. You'll find all my social media. You might want to check out some of the other places you might want to follow me. And there's a lot of contact information there too, uh, including the, you know, how to send me a DR carry question and many other things. So uh, check out my contact page for more information on that. So we've got a great interview for you today. I'm going to be talking with Adrianus Varmenhoven. Uh, from Nord, as in NordVPN. And we have some really great discussions on privacy and privacy technologies and VPNs, what they are and what they are not. And we talk about some other technologies as well, like Apple's private relay and regulations about privacy, all things privacy. He does spout off a couple terms that I want to just, you know, define very quickly. He talks about ISO 27001, which is an international information security standard, ISO I think it's actually a French name, but it's like International Standards Organization that has a lot of different, uh, a lot of different specs. Uh, if you were in the business world, I'm sure you've heard of some of them. Uh, SOC 2 is another one. That's just another security standard. He talks about TLS, which is Transport Layer Security. That is part of what makes HTTPS secure and some of our other web connections secure. So anyway, he just, we, we throw those terms out without defining them. So I thought I would, you know, as usual preface you with some of that information so that when you hear them, you know what we're talking about. Now, I've got a lot of other things to catch you up on and some other comments about this interview, but I'll wait until you've actually heard the interview first. So without further ado, let's get to our wonderful interview with Adrianus from Nord. Adrianus is a defensive strategist and threat intelligence manager at NordVPN. He is responsible for getting the most relevant IOCs, or indicators of compromise, malware samples and their indicators, and generally mapping out the threat landscape for the, cu for the company's customers. Welcome to the show, Adrianus. Hi, thank you for having me. So why don't we start off just telling me a little bit about uh, Nord and, and what you do there. Um, Nord is mostly known for its uh, VPN software, virtual private network, and... It has branched off, uh, giving customers more protection, um, both in the password managers and in encryption uh, devices. But we also now have an antivirus, or at least a start of an antivirus, uh, which is called threat protection. Uh, we also block trackers from that. And this is basically what my job entails, what my team does. So what is threat intelligence? Threat intelligence is that information that you need to know um, about, 
for instance, let, let, let's start with malware, um, a ransomware. So you need to know from which IP does it come from or which website, but also what types of behaviors does it have so we can recognize it as a process in, in, in your computer. But also threat intelligence can be like uh, different threat actors, like uh, hacker groups uh, doing specific things. Threat intelligence can be what kind of type of vulnerability exists. Basically, everything that, that the opposing uh, team also uses. Gotcha. All right. So what is it about the concept of privacy that you feel people today don't fully appreciate or understand? And, and in, your, in your definition, what, what does privacy really mean? You, t- you touched a really good point. Um, I get annoyed that people think about privacy as something you have to hide. And I really want to change that paradigm. Privacy means uh, you get to decide what you want to share. And if you have nothing to hide, you feel free to share everything you have. And the reason is this. If you say that uh, you have something to hide or nothing to hide, it means that somebody else actually already has the right to see and and, 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 uh, get their hands on everything you have. And you have, after the fact, have to decide, no, you shouldn't have that. But that's not true. Privacy is you have everything under your control and you say, okay, you're allowed to see this because you are the owner of of, of this information. And this is extra important nowadays uh, with the digital world because for all intents and purposes, your digital ID, your digital persona is more real to to companies uh, um, than you are. Hmm. Because think about the last time you ever really interacted with a human being for either a bank or buying something, uh, having a contract at at a streaming uh, software, installing an app, no humans in between. Your digital persona is you uh, for them. And it means that if you don't care about your privacy, a lot of other people can have parts or complete uh, access to your digital persona and do things on your behalf, which you never would have done. So your privacy, we really need to change that 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 paradigm and, and that way of thinking. We really need to ha- say privacy means everything is mine and I am allowed to decide what I want to share. And other people who have nothing to hide, nice, feel free to share everything. But as soon as somebody says, I have nothing to hide, I'll ask them for a couple of things. I'll ask them, well, send nudes because you have nothing to hide. Um, and so give, give me your, give me your credit card numbers, give me your credit card verification number, and please also the pin code to your debit card. <laughs> For some reason, I never get any of those. <laughs> right, right. And the, the other thing I think a lot of people don't kind of understand is that my pri- it's bigger than me. Like privacy is bigger than just me. What what I do affects other people as well. From things as simple as I'm posting a picture on Facebook, it's probably got me and other people in it, maybe even just people in the background. And with facial recognition technology being what it is, that now has impacts. You know, my contact list, should I choose to share that with Facebook to help me find more friends on Facebook, now gives away my my social graph. What do you, what do you think about that? I think that's because that's something I think a lot of people don't grok about privacy today is it's bigger than just you. Yes, that's a good thing you said. A while ago, I did a, a review for, I don't know, who, um, about the IRS for, uh, they were planning to use Amazon's Recognize um, engine, which is an artificial intelligence engine which can re- recognize uh, lots of things on images. And of, of course, I can understand why the IRS wanted to use that because they can verify that it's you. But what the Amazon Recognize engine also does, if you read through the documentation, is it can recognize other people as small as 32 by 32 pixels in the background. It can recognize objects. It can recognize uh, locations. So exactly as you said, uh, as soon as you post that picture or or make a picture with Amazon Recognize for the IRS, they know uh, what type of television you have. uh, uh, They know what... People were in the background. They would know where you were when you did this verification. Lots of information I did not want to share in the first place with them. And we see this more and more uh, with with things like Clearview. But there's also lots of other um, companies that are doing data harvesting. And it's not just advertisement anymore. It's also political, but it's also you, you can use the same information 
for uh, hacking or what was really b- uh, becoming common uh, is, is like phishing or uh, CEO fraud where somebody uh, pretends to be uh, somebody you know. This is all information you're giving away even with a simple photo. And, and those things you should really be careful about. Yeah, absolutely. What, what are the biggest threats today to people's privacy that maybe aren't getting enough attention or press? I mean, the landscape of privacy certainly has been changing and it's getting worse, unfortunately. But what is it you think that people aren't seeing that might be sneaking up on us or that's not getting enough attention today? To be honest, the biggest threat to, to privacy that I see is, is, is your amygdala. <laughs> um, the, your own part of the brain, and I'm, I'm not even kidding. TikTok, for instance, let, let's start with that, has an algorithm that is so incredibly good at keeping you scrolling in that screen video after video after video. And while you're doing that, you give away more about your preferences, and, and the TikTok algorithm can even de- uh, define what political leanings you have. It, it, it knows after a while so much about you, and th- this is why it's so good. And this is the, the actual uh, thing that happens in a lot of uh, privacy invasive systems, just like Facebook and the gamification of all these notifications. We get a small shot of endorphin of, of, of happiness whenever one of these algorithms triggers us. And we don't want to lose that. So when it says, well, you need to accept all of the cookies, otherwise you cannot see this, this little video. Okay, let's accept all, all these uh, cookies because... And then the next thing is, but the website is a lot better if you use the app. Okay, you install the app. And then it says, yeah, but the app needs uh, uh, access to your location. Otherwise, we can't. And we want all these yeah. extra features. We want all of that. When people, uh, the, the, there's this saying, um, if you're not paying for the product, the product is you. Mm. But people have no idea how to translate that and, and, and how that actually works. And how that actually works is simply by making you happy for things that, that you don't have to be happy or, or sad about, um, that, that don't relate to you at all, but which give you a satisfaction, just, just like nicotine or other drugs. This is basically uh, ut- utilizing that part of your brain to make you give up all of these rights you actually have and, and then say uh, to uh, the law, look, this person consented. Otherwise, they didn't click A or didn't, didn't, uh, wouldn't have installed the app. Mm. So that, that that's really... The biggest problem, uh, self-control, at least um, self-control, it would be really easy to say you have to uh, keep uh, self-control. But on the other hand, all these companies, they know what they're doing. They, they know exactly what they're doing. They're really good at, at this. And they know if we make the button like bright red, somebody is going to push it. If we make uh, the video like 10 seconds uh, shorter, people are going uh, to, to watch the next video. All of those kind of things about people are really cunning and, 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 and I feel mischievous uh, because people think they're in control, but they're not. And that leads into things like dark patterns and other things that these companies have done because they can do these experiments, these little micro experiments, these A-B tests, because they've got millions, in some cases, billions of, uh, of users that they can try one thing here and one thing there and see which one's better and just keep doing this or finding it until they get better and better. It's, it's not a fair fight. <laughs> so, but it's capitalism, right? I mean, this is, these guys are beholden to their shareholders. They are trying to make as much money as possible on their shareholders' behalf. So how do we stop that? What's the solution? I mean, these guys could argue that we're just doing a really good job at doing what we do. So, <laughs> right? So what's the, what's the solution? Yes. Um, the first thing would be to, to get more people to recognize that this digital stuff is also an addiction. We already got some semblance of of understanding with with gaming. I mean, there, there's people understand there's a gaming addiction when kids can't can't uh, step away from the video games. We should understand that this uh, what happens with with TikTok, Facebook, and all the other social media, but also the other gamified platforms. The exact same parts of the brain are triggered as with gaming addiction. So we the first step for, for me would be really be Guys, understand that there's a social media addiction or actually that they use the same tricks that cigarette manufacturers are using, having small bits of addictive things in there. And, and this is, is, is the first thing that, that we as a society should understand, that, that, that we are really everything that, that's popular and, and, and stays popular for, for, for quite a while has to do with, with addictions. And we need to understand it. Next step would be to regulate that. And, and, and this this sounds 
very European for me. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of things with law, mm -hmm. but I think that that that's where the the next step should be. Um, you can as a, a try and 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 some people say this online, delete your Facebook or or do the. For most people, this simply is not possible. It's the same as, as a heavy smoker that, that smokes two packs a day. Tell him tomorrow you just have to stop because otherwise you're going to die. Mm -hmm. This person will not stop the next day. And this is the same with, with all our social media. I find this uh, time and again when I'm telling people, okay, TikTok does this underwater, Facebook does this, and I can even show it to them. It doesn't matter. that They will still use it because they're addicted to all these connections and, and they feel a great sense of loss mm -hmm. if they don't. And then this is something we really should recognize as a society and, and then act accordingly uh, um, with the lawmakers, but also with, with uh, support groups and also uh, tell those companies and their shareholders they're acting unethically. We're doing exactly the same thing. Uh, the younger generation, and, and this is also something I tell them a lot, you're having a lot of hate against uh, what happened in the 1970s, 80s, 90s with oil and, and, and those kind of things and, and, and cigarettes. But you're doing exactly the same thing now. It's only digital. You're doing a lot of things that, that are not good for, for, for the whole of the humanity, but you act as if it's all good. And I, I'm, I'm sure in 30 years, people will look back at, at hmm. Facebook and at, at these years and say, wow, these people were really addicted to their stuff, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're right. So prior to the internet and in social media and maybe in particular, it was much easier to compartmentalize our lives. You know, we could share different aspects of ourselves in different situations with different people. You know, we had work lives, we had home lives, we had school lives and, you know, different sets of friends that didn't necessarily intersect. Is that still possible today? Have we forever lost the ability to have different avatars or profiles in different contexts? It, it, it is possible. I mean, me and, and a lot of security people do this, but the word already was there security people that, that that's people who, who are in this who have second nature and and, and use words like opsec uh, just for unplugging and plugging uh, in, in the laptop it, it is hard because again the convenience factor and and, and it will become even harder with this open authorization uh, protocol all out where you can log in to any website using google or log in uh, using facebook it means you're having the same digital persona all of the time and that is something that, 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 that also uh, is not very healthy for people because, as you said, compartmentalized. I also see this as having different facets of your pers uh, personality, giving that uh, some, some, some time of day. For instance, uh, if you're a musician, you, you like to play your instrument a lot, and, and that's a totally different person from maybe the accountant at the office. Right. And both have a different focus and both have uh, uh, different drives. But for, for the online world, these things are starting to mix. And I do not know if that's healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but my gut feeling tells me it's not healthy. For me personally, it, it, it's not, not that much of a problem because I already, due to my work, have lots of separated personas. In the beginning, uh, people were thinking, well, he's getting schizophrenic. <laughs> but no, it's, 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 it's just security best practice. But I, I do not think it's healthy for people to have one one persona all of the time and, and, and this persona uh, being badgered from, from all sides it can't be healthy. Well, not to make this, you know, hyperbolic or alarmist, but his, history actually has several examples where, you know, overzealous data collection has had life or death consequences. I mean, for example, the Germans are really meticulous about keeping records on their citizens. But when it came time to round up the Jews, it was really easy for the Nazis to do so because they knew exactly where they lived. And, you know, and then yeah. today that, you know, that may seem like a long time ago. That'll never happen. But in the U.S. today, now we're suddenly faced, you know, with the Dobbs decision that with the, you know, the reality is that. You know, if with easily obtainable location data, you know, it could be used to prosecute women who might be seeking an abortion. So, you know, what is, what is it going to take for us to learn that just because we can collect all of this data doesn't mean we should? Humans are really bad at learning things that are bad for them. Yeah. Again, with the fossil with the fossil fuel, when we started, we already knew it will end someday. So that, that that's the first thing I even remember. And, and when I was in school ages ago, uh, decades ago. I read things about that at one point, oil reserves from the world will be gone because it's just a, a squished dinosaurs. <laughs> and I, I was thinking, oh, wow, I don't hope that happens in my lifetime. But we already knew as, as, as a humanity, we, we knew that this was would be ending. But still, 
today we're, we're doing absolutely almost nothing to, to mitigate that. And the same thing will, will also happen with, with this data collection. Again, uh, so as long as it's convenience, people will, will do it. It's, it's, it's getting hard for me not to do things on my phone. Uh, I'm one of these persons who, who I don't want to have so many apps on my mobile phone. I don't want my app banking app on my mobile phone and, and, and all of those, those kind of things. But you're getting pressured into that. And at, at some point, people either give up against that pressure. And, and yeah, what is needed, I think, uh, really big crashes. Because if everything is digital, if, if the electricity is gone, well, nothing works. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, and, and uh, people can't communicate and, than anymore in, in, in the same way they did. I think that, that we're setting ourselves up for, well, really bad times. I have no idea how, how I, w- I would envision those bad times because it can, can either be a, a, a dictator like, like in, in the East at the moment, but it can also be corporations. It can be a, a few smart people. I have no idea how, how it will look like. These kind of things were already written about by H.G. Wells, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, people, if you read The Time Machine, a lot of people think it's about time travel. Well, kind of. Um, but the Victorians say they, they wrote a lot of uh, society-critical uh, books. And The Time Machine, actually, you have these people, if you read the book uh, a little bit further, you, you read that, that there's in the future, there's two p- t- kinds of people, the Eloy and the Morlocks. Mm-hmm. And the Eloy are the people, uh, in the beginning when you read it, you think, okay, these guys have it made. They have uh, uh, food. Everything is uh, taken care of them. They're happy and, and, and they they're have no worries. Uh, and the Morlocks are doing all the work. But if you read then, then on, then you see that, that the Morlocks are actually the masters of, of the planet because they will eat uh, the Eloy. They will manipulate them. Uh, they will just use them. And they use this carefreeness as a method to control them. So hmm. don't worry about, about any troubles because I will give you food. Don't worry about any clothing. I will, and as soon as they, they want to rebel, they say, no, if you're going to rebel, I'm going to take your food. And th- this is what we're self, uh, setting us up, up uh, for. It's a bit dystopian. <laughs> yes. So we've talked a lot about, you know, privacy online but in the virtual world. But, uh, you know, that's been a problem for many years now. But privacy in the physical world has recently become an issue, you know, with location tracking, license plate readers, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular radio scanning, facial recognition, ubiquitous cloud-connected video cameras with infinite data storage and you know, even DNA harvesting from the government or law enforcement databases. So privacy is becoming an issue in, in the regular world too, in the physical world. So how does, how does that threat differ from online data privacy? You can see that there was actually an interesting art project uh, by a Belgian guy. I forgot, I forgot his name. He recorded for, for a few months Instagram pictures made in, in, in a city in Belgium. But he also, at the same time, recorded all the open cameras that, that were available. And then he trained a small AI uh, um, thing, that, which is not, not very hard, to backtrack where all these photos were taken. And you can see the, the videos of those people setting themselves up for their perfect Instagram shot, but it's all on video. And, <laughs> okay, this, this was in the past, but I can imagine that it's really easy to figure out the, using these open cameras to track anybody and, and either kidnap, steal... All the things that, that that used to take a lot of preparation, and, and preparation is always like this extra bar or extra hurdle you have to take. And as soon as somebody some, something um, makes the cost higher, uh, the, uh, the criminal activity is less likely to uh, to happen. And with all these cameras, it's so easy to do uh, things on the spur of the moment. Uh, if I see that oh, this is a, a famous person, oh. This person has a, has a, a child with them, or they have a big bag with them, uh, or, or they drive this car. It doesn't really matter. All these physical criminal activities, which have, at the moment, have a big hurdle, these hurdles are t- being taken away just by having everything open and, and, and out there. Yeah, I saw that video. I'll, I'll put a link to the show notes. That was pretty freaky. <laughs> but I mean, it, easily understandable. I mean, that it, that, that is possible today. It's, it is crazy. Uh, okay, so kids today are growing up in a world full of surveillance, you know, particularly at school. Uh, have we normalized surveillance for this generation, you know, given all the data that's been collected about them, probably without their consent and maybe even without their direct knowledge? You know, do they have any hope of starting adulthood with a clean slate? <laughs> As father of, of, a, of a kid, this is something that, that really uh, keeps me up. To answer the, the last question, 
at the moment, I, I wouldn't see how the kids would, would start with a clean slate. That they're, they're starting even uh, behind. We have a lot of history which is lost. At least uh, I am at my age. I have no idea how old you are, but I'm, I'm guessing you're, you're around my age, maybe a little bit younger. <laughs> um, but we have a lot of history in in in, in uh, before the 90s, which is is, is just lost to history. So. Yeah. That's good for us. <laughs> right. But for them, their whole ID, the, 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 uh, I don't know, if, uh, something like a citizen service number. I, I think you have something like that, yes. uh, a social security number. Yes. And everything is linked to that. So all the uh, school performances, but also if they do anything else with, 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 the, with the government, like uh, excursions or, or training for, 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 for that, everything is linked to that. And it means you get a perfect profile and you can do a pre-selection without ever meeting anyone. And this will definitely uh, be detrimental to, to a lot of people that, that might have otherwise uh, gotten a few chances uh, in life, uh, but now are pre-selected or, or removed from selection later on. We've normalized this, this whole surveillance part in, in, in that uh, we also give teachers a bit of that. And, and that means that they get again. We trigger this, this this convenience, this this little bit of the amygdala uh, for the teachers, and, and and they feel happy about it. So because it makes their work easier, and, and teachers really don't have it easy. And when they find it normal, these kids growing up, ki- kids look at uh, adults, and they, whatever adults think is normal, mm. kids will find it uh, uh, normal. So they, they they see well everybody at school using uh, uh, this, and the teachers using. Uh, at the YouTube, but he's also monitoring all of us in our Chromebooks and then and, and, uh, while we're working on, on school. So that must be a normal thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. Uh, be doing it at, at school. Right. So yeah, that, that we have normalized uh, uh, this stuff. And there's always this, I don't know, I think it's a false dichotomy, but from security versus privacy. Right. I don't think it, 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 it's, a, it's a correct uh, dichotomy. It's the, the, the security part where they say, well, if we can't see what, what's happening, uh, we can't do anything about it. But just over the last uh, uh, year alone, you can see lots of things happening where there's uh, cameras around and, and where everybody knew everything. Well, in, in the US, you got the Uvalde, uh, mm-hmm. uh, I hope I pronounced it right, uh, a school shooting where the cameras were there. Uh, but we have all this monitoring ability and we could even have seen that, that, that the shooter uh, brought weapons. And it had, this didn't help the security. We can see uh, um, with all these cameras around, not a, a lot, and, and in my experience, security, and, and uh, it's even backed by, by uh, criminality numbers, has changed so much. Yeah. But we still like that, that, that feeling for some reason, that, that, that we like to see what's happening. And then, then the, so the, the security versus privacy the dichotomy is, is not valid. But the privacy of these kids... Well, we were allowed to do. No, we were not allowed, but but we did dumb dumb things in in, in our youth, and that, that's right. that's also how you learn. That's also how you right. uh, uh, experience the world. Yeah, I mean, you've got to push the boundaries, right? Yeah, and and and, and, and you you need to do at least one one thing that 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 that, that you so afraid that that the world is going to end, and finally your your parents go, are going to fix it. But things like that need need to happen for for, for you to to really get into the world and and not conveniently ease from, from one age to the other because that, that's basically what hap- what's, what's happening. It, it, it's almost yeah, like the cows with the VR helmets. Um, so, so, so they feel feel happy. And, 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 uh, and no, I'm not even joking. Oh, the, yeah, the, no, I know strong. exactly what you're talking about. But explain it for the audience. I've, I've heard of this, but I would explain that for the audience, what that is. Yeah, the, the, there's this farmer um, who, who read that, that cows are really happy if they see uh, green and, and farmland around them, but he didn't want to get them out of the uh, out of the shed. So what he did was buy a lot of uh, VR helmets and, and gave the cows VR helmets so they think they're in in, in a farmland and the cows are happy. And this is also the matrix stuff. And, and, and yes, and, but but basically, we allow our kids to go that way because they slowly are getting used to the surveillance stuff. They use that to the fact that if they do something really weird, suddenly a speaker shouts, don't do that or uh, go to the headmaster's office. And then 
they get uh, used to all of this. Um, somebody's watching over me and somebody will always tell me what, what's wrong and right. And, and that, again, is, is dangerous in, in that it doesn't build their own ethics. It's, it's, it's horribly cruel that, that, that some kids uh, burn uh, ants with their, with their uh, uh, magnifying glass. But most of them will get some feeling of remorse after that. And that's how you build your own ethics. You have to experience the world. And if you just get told what the world is like, you will never see anything wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's the panopticon. It's, you know, we, we act differently when yes. we know we're being watched. That's correct. All right. So here's a tough one for you. <laughs> Not that the other ones were easy. <laughs> but uh and this is something I struggle with too, especially as somebody who tends to recommend a lot of things to people because people ask me for recommendations, ask me for my advice. And that is how do we know which products and services and companies that we can trust? You know, if a product source code is published, does that solve the trust problem? How much trust a lot of these companies will do like a third party security audit or a privacy audit? Can we, can we trust those? Cause I, I know of cases where in, in both those cases where just because open source software was there, it didn't mean it was perfect or bug free or even private. And then there's certainly been cases where these third party audits who are paid for by the company are biased. So how, how would we have any hope as consumers or citizens to, to know who to trust? I'm going to start with, with a really blunt answer that there, there is no hope. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I, no, I can, I can defend that uh, in the world as it currently is. I mean, even if the source code is published, you have not seen the process of the compile run that builds the binary that's going to be on your system. I can publish source code and, and make a completely different product somewhere yeah. else. Uh, and you will find that almost none of these products say, this binary has been certifiably uh, compiled from this source code. Deterministic builds uh, is something that, that, that the people are looking at. So if you get products and I have open source and I compile it, I get exactly byte for byte the same build as that product. That would be a way to verify it. But given compilers, idiosyncrasies, libraries, and then mm -hmm. all of those kind of things, deterministic building uh, is really... Uh, as, as a norm, it's really uh, some way off. There are already some projects which manage to do that, but it, it's hard. So, But it's only for, for products that are open source. You, you touched a really good point uh, about this uh, auditing companies because what uh, the first thing you always have to ask about is what are they actually auditing? Because uh, there, there's so much text. For instance, uh, let's say uh, we, we take the certification of ISO 27001. I really like the framework. The auditors that I've met are, are extremely thorough and, and, and hell as a CISO. I've been CISO as well. They've been hell for me to audit. But here's the trick. You can just uh, pronounce that uh, some parts of your company are out of scope. Mm. So the auditor will only audit those things you declare as being in scope. Mm. And then you get this certification of being ISO 27001. And nobody reached the scope of that. And the same goes for a lot of other audits. Uh, let, let's say a SOC 2 compliance thing that is also security. It can be completely um, self-assessed by the CEO of a company. Oh, wow. So, so the, the, there's things like that. So it, it, it's extremely hard to know to trust. There are a couple of companies that I would trust ethically uh, uh, when they do a code review, but they're not always of course, uh, uh, hired by a lot of people. And as soon as they get big, then again, money and interests uh, take mm -hmm. over and, and um, it, it's a hard thing. I approach this issue usually from a risk, a risk acceptance standpoint. I think, okay, how much would company X or Y lose um, if their product, uh, if security researchers would pull it apart and it turned out to be uh, really uh, malicious. So a lot of the Microsoft uh, products, I implicitly trust, not, not with the privacy part, I'm, I'm doing <laughs> other things for that, mm -hmm. but it won't contain any malware. It, it, it will not uh, totally destroy and ransom my, my computer. Actually, it's the biggest ransom where you can install, but um, <laughs> yeah, you always have to pay for something. Yeah. Um, so I, I can implicitly trust trust them. Google about the same, Facebook a little bit less, but, but those companies, uh, they have other ways and, and, and they won't 
destroy you or, or, or uh, um, do really weird stuff because it, it would damage them too much. So they have more to lose than, than to gain from, from those things. However, most of the apps that become popular or, or uh, when, when, when Zoom started, I didn't trust Zoom. And then I, I was right in it, at least in the beginning. I don't I have no idea how, how they are now. But um, in the beginning, it, it, it was because it was growing too fast. And it, it, it might not even be uh, purposefully uh, at fault uh, for all of these things. There's a lot of other things that can also happen. And, and they've been audited uh, as well, even uh, though things went, went wrong after that. So you have to, just like uh, I approach it as risk trips, as I said, you have to think about the same way as when you're getting into your car on the highway. You can take route uh, uh, A, and, and, and that has a lot of cars, but people are driving nicely. Or you can take route B, where's fewer cars, but people drive like idiots. And then the, those kind of ass- assessments you, you, you can make. And also a, a bit with software. So apps that have no users in, 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 in uh, let's say, Europe, it, it, it might, might be, or in the US, it might not be a good idea to download it and be the guinea pig uh, there. And also check at reviews. But then all these things that you could do to protect yourself, people won't do because it's a lot of hassle and it, it, it takes some work. Uh, just today I had with the marketing department, we talked about all the legal text and the end user license agreements that you see in the software as well. And there's so many escape clauses there, mm-hmm. but nobody reads them. And if you read them, it, it, it's even becoming hard for me. And, and, and I'm, I'm a hacker, a coder. So I'm, I'm used to a lot of logical constructs. It, it, it even becomes hard for me to understand what are they saying? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and um, so, so, so you need, need sites like, like TLDR, um, too long didn't read, uh, where they explain uh, legal texts uh, in, in, in simple English for you. Technically, as I said, it, it, the, 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 there is nothing to trust. It's it, it just hoping. Um, this goes even for my hardware. I've, I've been involved uh, with, with checking for cases for supply chain poisoning. That means that, that there's malware or, or uh, spyware f- uh, from the factory already on there on, on, right. on either hard disk or, or, uh, or firmware or whatever. So not, not, not even hardware can be trusted right, right out, of, out of the factory. There is almost nothing you, you can really do. And, and the only thing is, is, is you have to um, assess how much are they making in, in, in doing something really right? And how much would, would they lose if, if they would, would mess it up? That's basically my method of, of, of checking. So I'm, I'm buying a, a Lenovo ThinkPad, even though Lenovo is also partially Chinese-owned, but a lot of the stuff comes, comes out of China anyway. So I'm, I'm guessing, so okay, uh, most ThinkPads, because they, they have this business image, they, they stand to gain a lot more uh, by, by not doing something bad. Because if they, if they were doing it, the whole business would crumble. Most of the business buy these things. Same goes for, for, for uh, the Apple systems. But I can't be sure. It, it, it's just an assumption of, of, of being uh, people being reasonable. And people aren't always reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the moves I've seen some, some companies make that I think is interesting, and I, I, I'd like to get your take on this. Uh, for instance, Apple has this thing called Private Relay. And it's sort of like... Instead of a a, mid, a, a Tor light or a, a, almost a, with a little bit of VPN flavoring too, it's it's this thing where they they kind of uninterrupt their traffic so that one side knows where who you are but not where you're going, and the other side knows where you're going but they don't know who you are. And there's also this buzzword of trust no one. That's a, that's a security thing now uh, where basically try to work in privacy by design and and try to make it so that if you can't trust one person, maybe if we can kind of distribute that trust so that for for me to really be violated privacy wise, multiple people not necessarily associated with each other would have to somehow collaborate. So I'm curious what you think about initiatives like that. And then second, you're in a position at Nord. I mean, what is what does Nord do to try to win people's confidence? I mean, obviously, you're in a position where you're trying to say we are secure and private, but you're actually in the position where you've got to somehow woo people to that, to that perspective. So I'm curious to know what you guys, uh, how you guys attacked it as a company. First, I really like that initiative uh, by Apple. You always have to uh, remember, and this is also something uh, we tell at Nord, that people, if they're going to the Tor setups, because at NordVPN, we also 
offer uh, that you have Tor uh, relays, there's always the fact of time. Half of the people are sleeping uh, um, during uh, your daytime. So if something happens and so some, somebody does something uh, during your daytime, it's probably not the, the half that is sleeping. So you can make a kind of determination. And uh, I'm saying this really simplistic, but there's a way to sieve out causalities on, on websites um, and have correlations. So I can ma- still kind of guess who, who, who does what. So privacy is not as simple as just switching on, on that, that uh, relay thing for, for full privacy. But okay, uh, it's, it's a good start. At North, we basically do everything to not know things about users. And this, this, um, the best way to, to, to verify this is, is just to join North because it, it's one of the nicest companies I've ever worked at. The vibe is really good. Just, just join it. Everybody will show you and tell you. And, and it doesn't matter if, if, if you're in, in, in whatever department you are, people will take that time and, and, and show and tell you. Basically, our, our exit, our, our VPN nodes, we build them in such a way that everything is in RAM. We don't save any admin accounts, anything or logging, and we just deploy them from our deployment system. So if there's a, a need for change in setting, it's not done on the system. It just gets rebooted and then uh, the new settings are there. That, that's one part. We do a lot of auditing, but also most of our discussion, and this is why I say just join Nord and, and, and you can see for yourself, most of the time we spent discussing how not to know uh, things about people. Let, let's say, for instance, for my department of so threat protection, if a malicious file is being uploaded to the cloud for uh, a further inspection by a, a heavier system. There's an enormous discussion on how we should do that so we don't know who sent us that, that file. And that, that's a really hard problem. And yeah. then, that's... That's where we actually spend most of the time on, hmm. on in, in, when we design all, uh, the software. And, and sometimes we have to drop features simply because we cannot think of a way uh, of doing it uh, without knowing things about people. Hmm. It's a hard one. And, and um, we, have, we have audits uh, and sometimes we have other companies uh, checking. Also, a really good way could be, if, if you have enough money, to get a North white label, which basically means you get to have all our stuff and you get to set it up in whatever environment hmm. you want. Um, we can give you the tools and, and, and then you can build your own Nord. And, this is, and then you can see what, what everything does. Hmm. Well, yeah, I really wish a lot of companies would, would, would look at it more like, <laughs> more like that. Data really should be treated like toxic, you know, nuclear toxic waste or biological hazardous material instead of gold. Because yes. that's, really, <laughs> that's really what it is. Right? You should be trying to minimize it as much as possible, contain it. And get rid of it as soon as you can. It'll be a while, I think, before we're all at that on that point. So in the U.S., if we can't get a you know a GDPR type privacy law, in the, in, in here, uh, obviously, as you said, the, the EU has uh, comes at these things a little differently than we do here in the U.S. We've we've struggled to get, get a true privacy law. But if we can't get there immediately, if that's not our first step, what about a law maybe that required radical transparency? Would that be? Is that maybe the next best thing? You know, something that would something would allow people to make informed decisions because we don't have that today. You can't look at product A and product B on a, on a shelf. Look at that router and this router, or that ring or that camera and this camera, and decide which one's more private or which one's. You know, they all say they have military grade encryption or whatever, but you can't really compare that. But but if I had maybe an independent third party or something doing, you know, like Apple's nutrition labels, I guess that's not independent, but you know, there's some sort of a standardized way where I could quickly compare products A and B and, and have a lot more transparency. In a in a very simple, easy to grok, very easy to compare way, would that would that be a good first step? Would that and then maybe once people see what's going on, maybe you know maybe that would allow us to finally have a privacy law. Do you think that that's a possible approach? It, it would be really nice to have uh, in the app stores. Uh, I really like the idea. It would be really nice to have in the app stores exactly something like the nutritional values. And in, in, in the Netherlands, we now have a health label which. This is really simple, A, B, C, D, E, F, where A is the best and F is, is, is the worst for the for health. The details you can look up later, but you just look at the A and see, okay, this is healthy for me. Or you look at the F and think, man, this is just indulgence. Hmm. Same, same thing we could do for privacy and, and, and for security and, and give it a grade of, of what type of information it, it, it sends out and, and have it in the App Store. Like for privacy, it, it's A because it doesn't send anything about you away. 
or it's an F because it sells you and then and, uh, everything but the soul. And for security, the same, the same way. But again, then everybody will have to work with it. And, and, and there's no incentive currently for mm-hmm. any of the software makers. And then you will probably get a lot of people saying, yes, but what about uh, the small software makers or, or the single uh, um, uh, one-person uh, app developers? That would be so much paperwork. They will never. Uh, they will always lose from the big corporations. Mm-hmm. So it, it might be a voluntary uh, thing to start with, or it might be something that the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, please support them, mm-hmm. might might make uh, 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 come into being. And volunteer groups, people sh- really should, if they think these things are important. Let, let's say we get to the uh, awesome point that that enough people think this is, is important and, and we finally get some traction on that people should also do do volunteer work in that in, in that because it won't come automatically because the current status quo is so optimized uh, for gains not for us but for gains for others that would be crazy to, to to support any change in that yeah so oh, real quick what is what does a vpn really do for our privacy because i think a lot of people don't <laughs> don't really understand what VPNs really do. I mean, it says private right there in the name, but I, I think a lot of people think of it as a silver bullet. So like, and maybe a, a way to illustrate that is how might a VPN service fail to guard my privacy? It, it gives away your, your IP address because a VPN in, in its most basic form is just designed to hide your IP address and to protect your uh, traffic. It might fail by uh, giving away your IP address, but it also might fail because the encryption is, is is bad and then somebody can still see your traffic. I need to say something about this encryption um, mm. because a lot of people think TLS website, that's totally enough for my privacy. This is not true because when you connect and then there's upcoming versions of TLS that, that will fix this and then will address this, but it's not currently the case. When you connect to a web, a web server, an IP address, that IP address needs to know which of the certificates, which encryption certificates it needs to pick and and, 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 and talk to you about. So it needs to know which web host uh, uh, it's connected. And you need to TLS, the first packet that gets sent to that host has actually the host name that you want to connect to. So I can see, even though you have a uh, encrypted connection, I can see that you want to do stuff with your bank or you want to go to Facebook or you want to go to an erotic website those things, even though there's TLS and encryption, I can see. With a VPN, I cannot easily see that. I could see that as the destination, but then I cannot deduce that it's you. So what a VPN actually does, it tunnels or encapsulates, packages all the traffic that comes from your machine. It sends it to, uh, for us, uh, uh, North, it's an entry node, and then there's a secondary node so that even we don't know who does what where. And then it goes to, uh, to the exit node, and the exit node finally talks to the website. All the answers go back to the exit node, and it sends it back to the first entry node, and then it sends it back to your device. So that means that your IP address is hidden, but also it's also protecting you against any people snooping for bad protocol implementations or protocols which are still in clear text, because mm. some of them people still do that. And also... It's really nice that it protects which type of protocols you're using. Let's say you're on vacation using public Wi-Fi. You have no idea who the person is uh, who's running that that public Wi-Fi. They can have a man in the middle, which is a a, a type of attack uh, running, but they can also just simply see that you're going to uh, uh, use RDP to your uh, company Mm -hmm. servers, or they use uh, something else like a, a specific protocol to access your NAS at home or something like that. Uh, and a VPN really covers that up and, and hides your IP ad- address at the same time. So how important is it that a VPN service is headquartered in a privacy-respecting jurisdiction? This is kind of another uh, layer or axis on the trust spectrum. Um, it, it you know, incredibly important. <laughs> all right. So talk to us a little bit about that and, and maybe explain to the audience that, you know, five eyes and 14 eyes and some of those kind of concepts. Well, we have this, uh, um, uh, let's start with the five eyes, uh, four eyes, but with, with the different countries, those are basically groups of countries that, that have agreed to share data and information with each other. And uh, maybe you can put in the show notes the, the exact uh, countries, um, yeah. I don't know them by heart. But what this means is that if under the jurisdiction of country A, uh, they gather some intelligence or, or data uh, about you, 
they can store it. And then country uh, B, which is also uh, part of the group, says, I want to know about this person, about Gary, for instance. Um, did you already uh, have something on it? Say, oh, wait, we can share that because we already ha had some information on that. Even though that maybe on, in country A, the information gathering method is legal. In country B, that's uh, going to ask it. That information gathering method is not legal. But since the data is already there and the agreement is there, they're only sharing data. They're not doing this information gathering right. uh, in an illegal way. So that those are ways for those countries to get around legalities in their own country and, and privacy legalities. And why it's important for uh, companies like Nord to be in, in, in a jurisdiction as a company, because you cannot get wholesale tapped. We have immense discussions with some countries about they wanting to have uh, snooping in, in, in our VPNs or anything else uh, or logging. And then we say no, or you get, you might get just like China, a specific version for your country. No other user uh, around the world can connect to it, but it's for you, for your people. And we will tell them everything can be logged. But this is if, if because we are in, in, in the headquarters in Panama, it means the wholesale of, of North can never fall under, under this single discussion. It's only where we decide to have exit notes or, or notes or VPN notes where we have a specific discussion with that country about that legality. So for India, we have a specific discussions mm -hmm. and we can say, okay, if you don't like it, we can just pull all our notes and, and, and go somewhere else. Uh, they cannot force us to add logging to all of our notes. And if you have something in, in, in a different country, let, let's say we have, uh, we were, would be headquartered in China, it would mean as soon as China says all of your notes need to have logging, we would have need, need to comply with that. Mm. And now we only have to fight each jurisdiction or the easiest way for us is to say, okay, then we take your uh, the, the, your neighbor. We put our data centers in in in, 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 the, in the at the neighbors who have different laws, and it's easier for us to to make that effort. And um, you can also see if you look at we publish the, where where all the notes are, and you can actually follow uh, if you follow the news sometimes, you can actually see where we have the legal battles and where we just say we pull out too bad for you guys. Right, like with India, right? Yes. So the, the, the problem with all this intelligence sharing, of course, is that in this way, they also evade uh, the legalities. And that means you can also use this VPN to make sure that your data isn't collected in the first place. What does the future hold in the fight for privacy rights? What And, and where can people go to learn more and maybe get more involved? You, you uh, alluded to that as well. Yes, I, I think one of the things they really should should go is, is to the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the, the people that, that uh, do Mozilla, sponsor Mozilla as well. And, and, and uh, they do a lot of good things uh, for the Internet. They've been around a long time. That's one part. There's lots of podcasts on, on, on privacy, but also read up on, on, on your laws in your country. I know this podcast is probably mostly listened to in the, in the US, so get involved. You can really make, make, make a difference and, and get involved because those, those laws are about you. There's, of course, a lot of measures you can take to stay anonymous, but I think they're mostly stop gaps. Just as we started uh, out with privacy should be something you uh, decide to share. I also think it, it, it's not something you have to, def you should have to defend. Uh, you shouldn't have to defend your privacy. And, and, and so you have to tell your government or, or any uh, legal uh, entities that, that are above you, this is not okay and, and, and make a change in there. So really get, get active in there and also get information to your schools, talk to your children. Um, this is also really a big gap. I'm, I'm seeing almost no parents are talking to the children about hazards online. We, we, we still remember stranger danger from our, mm -hmm. our youth but there's no talking about from parents about the same thing online. Mm. And still, we rather have Apple and, 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 and uh, others and, and the European government now have automated CSAM, uh, child sexual abuse material scanning implemented, which are on our devices, which look through all our pictures because we just damn it. We, we won't talk to our, our children about don't do this. Mm. It, it, it's it's some, something that, that, that could be easily uh, be done. Some other resources about privacy. Yeah, I, I would really uh, um, start looking in in, in, in forums and, and Reddit and, and really talk to people. Don't, don't mm -hmm. just 
ingest information because you might make a mistake or um, there's other people that, that can help you in your specific situation and not all privacy is, is fit for everybody. Um, the most ardent privacy uh, uh, aficionados, they do so, so many things that even I would not do mm. because I would feel them uncomfortable. And the problem is if you only listen to those people, you think privacy as a whole, right. I'm, I'm not going to do that. So talk to different people, see what you can do. And, and, and also make an assessment for yourself. Yeah, you're, figure out I, what your threat model is, right? Yes. Th- think, am I okay with this? So yeah, th- th- have a look at your uh, at your life. Just, just like you, you do your finances, do the same thing with your privacy. Ha- have an assessment for yourself. Say, okay, I'm on Facebook. That means they get all this kind of data. I'm, I'm doing this banking. And it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And, 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 but most, most of it, talk to other people about it and exchange ideas and, and exchange uh, views on it because you'll in, in support you, you you'll get, get a lot farther just on your own you will get de- depressed and and, and think hmm. it, it will never change I'm just a single person but most people actually want it but because we are so isolated even though we're all connected because we just consume and, and, and not hmm. not really communicate you feel so alone and you feel so powerless so Go out there and, and, and talk to other people about it. Yeah, that's a really great point. I agree completely. So in all this, is there anything that gives you hope? As you look ahead, do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? Is there something something on the horizon that you think is going to be a positive? Or are we, are we, are we going to have to hit bottom before things get better? No, I, th- I think you already can see, and, and this is with some of the younger people, once you start talking with them, and, and, and this is... What, what privacy uh, uh, advocates really should do, not just call them privacy advocates. Talk to people. I, I think your podcast is awesome. Really talk to the younger generation, and uh, they get it, but they hadn't been taught before. Um, while they grew up, nobody talked to them about privacy, just about how you could uh, uh, work with a computer. Well, just throw a computer in, in, into a, a, a group of five or se- uh, six-year-old uh, kids, they will figure it out faster mm. than you can explain it. <laughs> but we spent so much time in explaining how this computer works and not how privacy and all the other things work online. Mm. So my hope really is, and I, I see this already with, with, with the people at North, the five there already, but also the, the, the other young people I, I see at uh, congresses uh, I, I speak at, the younger generation will get it, but they will have an immense struggle if we don't act now uh, to fix those things. Again, just as with, with, with the fossil fuels, we went so far that it's really a tough job to, to fix that. And the same is now happening uh, with, with, the, with the privacy and, and security part, but they will get it. I think at, at some point they, they, they could fix it, but it, it will take a lot of effort. Well, I hope the younger generation fixes it for us because we, <laughs> we definitely have issues. <laughs> well, Andrew yes. Andes, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was a, a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed that. Likewise. Thank you. I want to thank Adriatus for coming on the show again. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to him about those topics. And we, uh, I asked him a few other questions, as usual, for my bonus content for my patrons. We get a little more technical. We talk about WireGuard and some other VPN technologies. And we also have a fun little discussion about the future, including augmented reality glasses. So uh, my patrons will be getting that, as usual, on Thursday. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you might go to patreon.com and look for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I will be doing a fun promotion coming up for my patrons to get the new version 2.0 of the super cool Dragon Challenge coins. Uh, But those will be available to existing patrons as well. So there's no reason to wait. If you want to become a patron, you can do that now. I also have some great promotions coming up for the 300th episode. It will be announced on that 300th episode, which will air on November 28th, when I will interview none other than Bruce Schneier. So lots of great things coming up. All right. So I did say I have a couple of comments on the interview. So I, I want to say I really like his idea of banding together with other people to do these things. I think that's a great idea. You know, you don't have to do this alone. Learning about security and privacy can be daunting and it's easy to get frustrated or even bored, you know, just give up or, you know, maybe you just keep putting it off. So, you know, I think that's a great idea. Talk to friends, you know, make a pact you know, to learn and work together and make it a group project, you know, kind of like a book club kind of a thing. You know, it, it's always more fun with more people. And you can kind of split up the duties a little bit. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I, I'll have to think about that some more and maybe come up with some way to formalize that. But I think that's a wonderful idea. 
he briefly talked about this project. I think he said it was a Belgian person. It, it, I looked it up because I had seen this myself. It's called Project The Follower. And I've got a link to the website in the show notes. Unfortunately, though, for some reason, the video that he had posted that shows what he was talking about, where he had found Instagram influencers who posted pictures, but also did this in front of public IP cameras that are constantly broadcasting, which he was monitoring. And he showed you how he found that person walking up to that place and setting up this perfect influencer Instagram photo and match the two by using facial recognition. It's really interesting. And the, unfortunately, the video is gone. I don't know if he's got to repost it, uh, but I did put a link to the to the website and the show notes. You might got to keep an eye on that. It was really quite interesting. I, I'm really bummed that he took the video down. We also talked about Five Eyes. And I, I've mentioned this before in the show. It's been a little while, but it's basically a multilateral signals intelligence sharing. It's not really a treaty, an agreement, I guess. Uh, and in, in this case, the Five Eyes countries are Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK, and the United States. And there are similar agreements with other countries, the, the more countries. There's one called the Nine Eyes Agreement. There's a 14 Eyes Consortium. There, there are several. There's a link in the show notes if you want to learn more about those kind of things. But basically, they're information sharing between intelligence agencies of these countries. And just like he said, just because it's not legal for, let's say, the NSA to spy on people here, it's not supposed to be. They're, they're supposed to be outward facing doesn't mean they can't go to one of these other five eyes country and say, Hey, I, I'm not allowed to spy on my citizens, but you are, what do you got on this guy? So we talked about that in the context of how important is it that you choose privacy services that are located in countries outside of these five eyes or nine eyes countries where they have, you know, intelligence sharing agreements. That's, that's a tricky subject. Uh, and I, you know, I, I will stick with Adrianus' answer on that. It's important. It's also kind of hard to do some, some of these services you wanted to use. You can't control where they have their headquarters and they may move their headquarters. And just because they are in a country whose jurisdiction doesn't allow for some of this information sharing, doesn't mean that they still don't share it. So it, it's a tough one, but I think it's something that's still good to be aware of, which is why I asked the question. And then finally, he talks about supporting other organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Mozilla Foundation. Uh, I completely agree. In fact, I've got an annual blog post that I update for this called uh, Give Thanks and Donate. And I've got a link in the show notes. And it's about that time. It's, you know, Thanksgiving holiday is rolling around soon here in the United States. So it's a good time to mention uh, if you go to my website or if you go to the show notes for this show uh, and look for Give Thanks and Donate, I've got a little article there about giving back. And, and this is kind of an easy way if you want to further the cause of privacy and security and and your rights in relation to those things these groups are out there doing it every day and so if you don't have the time to do something yourself give money to the people who are already doing it and doing a good job at it i'm actually an ongoing supporter for both eff and mozilla and i periodically send donations to a lot of these other groups as well it was great to get Adrianus on here. It's always fun to get people from outside the United States on the show. I know I'm in the United States. I know a lot of what I talk about here is U.S. focused because I live here. And <laughs> so I'm, a lot of the news and things that I, that I see tend to be focused on where I live. But I do try to make this accessible to a global audience. And so if there is a really big story uh, brewing outside the U.S. that you think I may not know about, let me know. Shoot me a note. Uh, send me an email at feedback at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. I'd be happy to evaluate it as a, something to talk about on the show. I really want to make this appeal uh, not just to folks in the U.S. And also just generally send me your questions. Uh, dear Carrie, uh, I started this last month. And so I will be sending out the first winner of my book to someone who submitted a question. And all you got to do is shoot me an email at dearcarry at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. And if you go to fdsd.me slash QNA, again, there's a link in the show notes. It'll tell you all about how to do it, including, if you wish, actually sending me uh, an audio snippet of yourself asking the question, which I will play on the air. And then once a month, for all the people who have submitted questions, I will reach in the virtual hat and pull out a name and send them a free copy of my book. So there's your incentive. One more thing, if you are in the U.S., uh, we've got the big midterm elections coming up. No matter how you plan to vote, please do vote. Get out there and make your voices heard. This is a democracy, and the way that we all participate is when these times roll around, we register our opinions. So get out there and vote. All right, that's going to do it. I got a great shows coming up. I'm going to be talking with three different people, three of the four authors of a, a new edition of a book called Blown to Bits. It's a really great book. 
It's a really fun interview, and it's the first time I've ever had that many guests on the show at one time. That will be our next interview. Next week, of course, I'll have a new show, then that panel interview, then another new show, and then the big 300th episode with Bruce Steyer. I also just recorded a great interview with Josh Corman. He's a very interesting person who's done some really neat stuff. He helped to found a, a wonderful group called I'm the Cavalry. We're going to talk about that. So lots of great interviews in the works. Subscribe if you haven't already. That way you won't miss any of this goodness. If you have a chance, I'd love to get some nice five-star reviews on Apple Music. And stay tuned for updates on the fifth edition of the book, which will be coming out soon. All right, everybody, stay safe out there. Take care. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>